Well, to another newsletter. New newsletter. <laughs> that so, was a lot of work actually doing those, but it's so worth it. Well, you know, so we uh, we publish a newsletter which is on our site and you can subscribe to it from our website at www.nrlawyers.com. But it's a newsletter on sexual assault law updates, which is very comprehensive and very well written. Um, All and the most important decisions, so what you need to know about the changing law of, of sexual assault. And the most recent one, our August 2022 uh, newsletter was two very serious Supreme Court decisions, the JJ decision which we spoke about in a previous podcast and one on stealthing right. with respect to condom use which we're going to talk about now but because we get a lot of comments and questions about the law here in Canada versus the United States or the UK or other areas if people want more information they can go directly to our website and go to the newsletter again www.nrlawyers.com and you can go to newsletter and subscribe and it's free and we really try and hone down into the uh it's basically the every two months it. you know the, yeah. there are some times where there's so many decisions coming out we were publishing monthly but then it now becomes it's kind overwhelming of, yeah um but yeah so this case is really important because obviously it's important that people know whether or not when they have sex they're doing it legally and yeah. uh Stealthing has actually been a, a growing subject of concern for what I like to call carceral feminists. That is a feminist legal theory that seeks to imprison more people. <laughs> but explain stealthing for a moment. So this is a really important decision in Canada. It's, again, a Supreme Court of Canada decision. It's uh, Kirkpatrick. It has altered the law landscape somewhat here. We agree with the decision but not how the majority arrived at their decision. And we want to analyze it a bit because it has some very serious implications. But let's explain what yeah. stealthing is, how this became a significant issue, how we got here, and then we'll talk about I want to leave and, and why with the this dissent. decision is kind of important in terms of where they disagree. Because there's a majority and a minority, and they both agree on the outcome that the appeal should have been dismissed. Right. But they uh, but they disagree on the method on how they got there. And the method seems like it's just a technical issue, but it's, but it's actually not. quite important. Yeah. So um, just for a little bit of background, prior to this, and I think it was 2014, I have it right in front of me actually. Oh, I have the wrong document. Anyway, um, 2014, there was a decision uh, in a case called Hutchinson. That's right. And it was very, very... Um, unpopular the decision and in that case it was very unusual facts in which a guy wanted to prevent his girlfriend from leaving him so he poked holes in a condom to get her pregnant and so bad the the question in that case was whether or not um she had consented to the sexual act but her consent was vitiated by fraud so again take it slow so everybody understands because these are legal terms that not everybody understands so th the main question was whether or not it was legally sound to say that the qualities and conditions of a sexual act, you consent, so let's be clear, let, we'll go with what was, you know, this case in Hutchinson. She consented to have intercourse, vaginal intercourse with um, Hutchinson, but um, she believed that a condom was being used and he presented like a condom was being used. She consented to the act, so he had consent, but there was a condition and quality to that act, you know, in terms of what she consented to, and that included condom usage. And so they had to decide whether or not she actually consented to the act, or whether the condom was part of the act, or whether it was a quality and condition that because she was deceived, it was an act of fraud. Okay, so this is a great point. Again, I apologize if anybody thinks this is very academic, but it's a really important point here that Diana is making. So in Hutchinson, the, the majority held that condom use is not part of sexual activity in question as defined in the criminal code. So in Canada, they decided, Supreme Court of Canada in 2015, that condom use is not part of, quote, sexual activity as defined in the criminal code. That's important because sexual activity contemplates a certain act. However, when a person agrees to have sex on the condition their partner wears a condom, but the condition is circumvented in any way, 
The sole pathway to criminal liability is the fraud vitiating consent. So what that means is two people decide to have sex. Okay. Wear a condom. Okay. I'll wear a condom. Then that person decides to do something stupid like sabotage the condom. That is a fraud. So what Hutchinson said, which I think was correct, you and I agree, is that sexual activity, consent to sexual activity, is the act of intercourse or other sexual act, period. But if the, it's premised on the fact that you're going to use a condom and the person sabotages it, it ruins the consent. In other words, you don't have consent. That was a condition. That was the Hutchinson decision, and I hope we've explained that correctly. And the reason why it's important to say that <clears throat> there was consent, but it was but there was fraud involved in, in obtaining the consent um, it is a little more difficult to explain, but it is very important. And I, I just want to point out from Hutchinson that they actually thought about a lot of different aspects to this yeah. when they came to this decision. They struggled with it. And one of the points they made was that, um, one, um, interpreting consent too broadly would criminalize a lot of, potentially criminalize a lot of acts that were not intentional. Right. Right. And they also say that, uh, you know, under the majority of the Court of Appeal that was coming to them, their essential features of what was consented to, the essential features of the sexual act test, uh, a man who pierces a condom may be found guilty of sexual assault. Why would a woman who lies about birth control measures not be equally guilty? Under um, the minority in this decision, their reasoning uh, for the test <clears throat> the quality or effectiveness of a condom changes the sexual activity that takes place. Why would it not follow that an individual might be prosecuted for using an expired condom or a particular brand of condom? Anomalies abound. The how the physical act was carried out test appears not to capture a woman who lies about taking birth control pills, but it might well capture a woman who lies about using a diaphragm. So think about that for a moment and let's be slow about this. So again, the whole idea in this Kirkpatrick case is that they have expanded, the majority in the Supreme Court of Canada have expanded the definition in our opinion and the minority's decision, so a few judges, four in this case, that the definition of sexual activity under the criminal code has now been expanded, which was completely unnecessary. And it calls into question other possibilities, hypothetical, maybe it comes true or not, but think about it. If somebody agrees to sex to use a condom and the male in the case has a expired condom that for whatever reason fails, they could be liable for sexual assault. Sorry? Or it breaks. I mean, I remember. Or it breaks. Yeah. So you could be then captured within the sexual activity definition and therefore seriously liable for sexual assault and have to explain that away on a trial as opposed to that not constituting sexual activity and you could look at the more broader question as to whether there was a fraud committed which is much harder to prove so what's really interesting and i just want to read from the dissent for a moment and yeah. diana i think it's will strongly go from, worded it's strongly worded and we've dissent. said this in our last well, it's episode. not exactly a, a dissent because they concur on the uh, outcome but Okay, so let me... Separate reasons. Yeah, yeah, so we have a unanimous decision of the Supreme Court of Canada, but four of the judges have a different path to why they agree with the majority, but it's a very strong opposition. Let me say that. Mm -hmm. A very strong opposition as to how the majority arrives at their decision. We think this is significant because we are seeing a divide in our Supreme Court, like I haven't seen in a long time. That's been noted by the media as well, talking about how many uh, um, decisions have dissents, not just dissents, but strong dissents. Strong dissents. And we saw this in the JJ decision, which you spoke about in a podcast that was just dropped. And you're seeing this very strong divide. And the oppositional <laughs> group of the Supreme Court of Canada had very strong issue, not only with the coherence of the assessment or analysis by the majority, but the methodology by which they got at their decision. And, and that's not just you summarizing. They use the words incoherent and illogical. Very serious language. Yeah. 
And they specifically state the Hutchison decision categorically stated that condom use is not part of the sexual activity in question contemplated by the criminal code. Where a person agrees to have sex on the condition their partner wear a condom, but the condition is circumvented in any way, the sole pathway to criminal liability is fraud, vitiating or eliminating consent under Section 265. Forget it, just vitiating consent. But they went on to further criticize, the majority gives short swift shrift to the court's definitive answer to the very question raised in this appeal. In doing so, our colleagues superimpose the Hutchinson minority view on this settled legal question, despite correctly pointing out what the minority says is not the law. So this is legal jargon for saying they really take uh, umbrage with the majority judgment. There's no other way for me to say it, where they essentially overturn Hutchinson. And again, while saying that they're not overturning it. While they're saying they're not overturning it. Again, because they weren't justified. This may be a bit dry and a little too legal, so we got to break this down for you. But this is really important. So, it's really but, important. To make it clear why this is important is that, you know, judicial activism in Canada is something that has been talked about and um, has been sort of like a warning, warning, this is going on, to the extent it has its own Wikipedia page of judicial activism in Canada. Explain that slowly so people get it. Okay. Judges, um, I remember reading this once and it was, a, it was a great analogy. Judges have erasers, not pencils. They can erase unconstitutional law, but they cannot write law. Well, they're but not supposed to. What they can do is they can change the meaning of law by the way they interpret it. Because the judges decide how to interpret laws. And so that gives them a lot of leeway to actually change the law in Canada and it's very important to separate out the legislative branch, which makes the laws, uh, and have it be independent from the judicial branch, which determines how to apply the law and whether or not it's constitutional. Okay, so we have government, right? We have parliament in Canada, and they make law, and it goes to the Senate, gets approved, and then it can be contested in the court. So there's a distinct uh, you know, barrier between the two. The courts are not supposed to rewrite law. What's really striking about this decision, and when we look back at the JJ decision, and you and I might have had a bit of a debate about this. Well, I mean, no, it starts out the first two paragraphs talking about the public, you know, wants something different and we need to do better and basically talking about wanting to increase conviction rates. Right. And so I, I, I might have taken a soft approach by saying I don't necessarily believe that the majority of the Supreme Court wants wrongful convictions, but there's social activism going on and there's judicial activism, maybe motivated by social activism, which oh. is not their f***ing job. And this isn't just us saying it. This is what the, the minority in this decision is saying. They actually spend some time talking about the influence of, uh, of activists and uh, advocates and so on and how much time was spent in the majority decision referencing all of these academics who didn't like the Hutchinson decision. This is really, really important. Yeah. So can you explain that more? Because there's some academics who've significantly criticized. These are law professors who significantly crit criticized the Supreme Court of Canada's decision in Hutchinson. And they are taken into consideration by the majority, wrongfully in our opinion. Often cited. And often cited, we think it's nothing, okay? Because they have not spent time in the trenches defending people, defending people who are innocent and wrongfully accused and watching the pain on their faces and the family's faces and what harm it does. So they're just sitting in some office with tenure writing bullshit without knowing what really goes on. There's one so this is really important. So let's take it slow. Yeah, and there's one book by an, an author who I'm not going to name, but who's cited here that actually um, is all about criticizing the way defense lawyers handle um, cross-examinations and, and how they present their cases. And when I went through that, I was in shock because every case she looked, she talked about was actually a false ac accusation. Correct. Maybe the way, you know, she didn't like some of the words that were used, but there is a lot of evidence for pretty much every single case that each case she chose to talk about, she has no criticism for false accusers. 
it was all about demonizing the way trials go on. And this is a very highly cited author in the Supreme Court of Canada. And, and, and centers in this decision. So let's, let's circle back for a second. Okay, so we have this case. It's about condom use. We absolutely agree, all of us, that if a person agrees to sex with a condom, that's important. It's a condition. It's a condition, but it's not part of the definition of sexual activity. If somebody circumvents that by fraud, then that should be a sex assault. But you don't change the definition of sexual activity. And they wanted to do that. And this is important because the statutory interpretation of the definition of sexual activity must be a consistent definition. Pause. We need to know consistency. There's something called stare decisis, which is, means we need to rely on precedent. What the courts say should be law that we can rely on. We can't just operate on whim. And in this particular case, the, 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 the opposition of the four judges state, the meaning of sexual activity in question cannot differ from one offender to the next. And that's a really subtle but important point. Our definition needs to remain the same so that we have consistency in the law. It doesn't mean that we think this was a wrong decision by all of them. It just means the root and the methodology by which we get there is important. And the problem with the majority decision, or again, it's not a dissenting versus majority, but the judges who changed the definition here f up stare decisis and they f up the definition and that is problematic for the future and frankly we see it or i see it i'm not speaking for you as social activism never mind judicial activism i think they're bending towards the pressure from the politics of these groups mm -hmm. and it's wrong and it's bad public faith in the legal system is important but there's two aspects vitally important there's the you know whether or not people on twitter like decisions is one aspect of public faith in the legal system. Right. The other aspect is faith that the legal system will be consistent. And this is so important. Diana, say that again. Slowly. You have to know. This is really important. You have to be able to know if you're breaking the law because ignorance of the law is not a defense. So the public should have confidence. And this is actually four judges of the Supreme Court of Canada. The public should have confidence that the law will not change simply because the composition of the panel or the court hearing a legal issue changes. There is a point beyond which frequent overruling would overtax the country's belief in the court's good faith. The legitimacy of the court would fade with the frequency of its vacillation. And Holy... Yes. This is a serious. It's not a joke. Separate set of reasons. It's not a joke. This is serious about the validity of our our, our legal system right now. And so I actually watched. We're that. not. It's not like leaves floating in the wind. I know. We need to rely on the consistency of legal decisions. So I watched the webcast when this was actually being heard. This case, and then we had to wait for quite a few months to yeah, get yeah. a decision in it. But there were two things that I recall standing out to me when I was watching the webcast, and it's available on the Supreme Court website as well. But um, the uh, I got to delve into Chief this. Chief Justice Wagner was on the majority in Hutchinson, and um, Justice Moldaver, who is you know in the majority on this decision, was in the minority on Hutchinson. And at one point, as they you know they were being essentially told, yeah, we think you should overturn Hutchinson. Our Chief Justice said, um, you can't just retry a case and try to overturn it because there are different faces because a lot of judges had changed from Hutchinson in 2014. Just because there's new faces on the court, you can't just come back and try to relitigate a case we've already decided. No, there's good, that's a good point. And in fact, there's a, a point made in the minority on this decision in Kirkpatrick, where they said they've essentially substituted the minority decision in Hutchinson for the majority. Pause. And what does that mean? They basically just swapped the decision from a precedent setting case while claiming they were not overturning Why the previous decision. So here's the thing. The reason I read out this stuff about, well, from Hutchinson saying, what about women who lie about birth control? I thought it was really cheeky and really clever. <laughs> I know you like, the I word, like that yeah. when I use the word cheeky. Yeah, yeah, that's good. How they went about justifying this. So they said, 
that qualitatively sex with and without a condom are two separate, completely separate acts. The exact same, let's imagine every single move down to the second, down to the, every thrust, exactly the same, right? But one has a condom and one doesn't. This is a qualitatively different act. And I think the reason they did that is because they wanted to avoid making women's deception illegal. So they basically made penises different than other body parts. Yeah, maybe. With a condom. And here's the other thing from the webcast that stands out. Justice Rowe, who was also in the minority on this decision, he goes, when you have sex, there's always a risk that a condom will break. It might fall off for some unfortunate people. Um, and uh, y- and y- you might get a sexually transmitted disease, you know? So when you think about it, what are the reasons to use a condom? Nobody prefers the feeling of it. You only use a condom for two reasons, to prevent STDs and to avoid pregnancy. But they pretended and pretended, no, they literally said that you are agreeing to indirect contact, contact if the person's wearing a penis versus skin to skin contact. Wearing a condom. You said wearing a penis. Wearing a penis? Did I? Oh, sorry. They might have wearing put that penis. on. But, well, you know. some people do, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's possible. <laughs> but no, no, but you're, it's so a good point. So wearing a, yeah, no, um, but skin to skin versus not skin to skin. I mean, these things tend to not be very thick. You made a point earlier when we were talking about this. If you punch somebody with your fist or you punch somebody with a glove on, it's still the What's same the con- difference. Right? Not to say that necessarily you know, sex has to do with punching. No, but, but the reality is to, <laughs> to, to parse out, this is, it comes down to such a fine analysis here and it's really stupid. So if you commit an assault by punching somebody barehanded, it's an assault. If you wear a glove and you punch somebody, it's still an assault. The exact same assault. But it doesn't change the definition of assault, whether you wear a glove or not. But they decided to change the definition of sexual activity. And, and the dissenting opinion in the majority, I keep saying this, they all f-ing agreed, but they said something important. The Hutchinson decision in 2014 should have remained the law. Why? Because the legitimacy does not depend on popular agreement with outcomes. It's squeaking. Legitimacy does not depend on popular agreement with outcomes. And that means we're not ruled by popular opinion. And it's very important that the public and our courts, the lower courts, can agree and understand what law is. I can't underscore this importance. This really rips out the rug from what we understood as law from Hutchinson. And it's bad. And like, I mean, just to echo the sentiments of the minority, it's disingenuous the way they went about doing it. You'll go further than I will, word, but, but I, 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 think it's, I think it's motivated by something else. I, mean, I don't think they want to be inherently disingenuous. I think they're social activists. And I think it's bad. Well, that's, yeah. I don't think they're disingenuous. Well, the whole I think they the think what they're is, doing is right, the whole but I think it's wrong. They claimed they didn't overturn Hutchinson, is well, why I'm did. using that word. Well, that's bullshit. And, that, and that's, that's, what, bullshit. that's what the minority says. That's bullshit. You can't just say something and make it true. You actually have to show it's not true. You have to actually have and some I'm disappointed. path of logic. I'm disappointed there. that they decided to do this. But here's the other thing. So, you know, we, we have this one professor, uh, Craig, uh, about her concept of stare decisis. So... Stare decisis, again, the consistency of precedent. And why is that important? Again, because we need to rely upon decisions from courts to guide lower courts and guide humans as we operate our lives to know this is the f***ing law, okay? So this professor writes that stare decisis is, quote, inherently conservative concept. and Conservative, political. Inherently conservative concept and one without an intrinsic value. She argues the doctrine should be abandoned whenever it does not align with the values it is said to serve. They reject the, the, the minority decision for people in, in the, the States, majority. Though, for people in the States, they need to understand that one of our political parties is called the Conservative Party. But conservatives has a meaning both in the United States, Canada, the UK, everywhere else. We know what that means. The four judges in the opposition opinion rejected the notion that stare decisis is inherently conservative. conservative. The doctrine has no policy slant 
To the contrary, proper application of stereo decisis protects progressive development of the law. Protects progressive development of the law. So this is another thing. Whether or not we would agree with whatever. Citation. You know, let me say it this way. Stereo decisis demands judges give sober second thought to revisiting precedent. Regardless of the ratio or the principle set out in the decision, the framework of analysis we set out must be adhered to. And that is very academic talk. And so most people I'm don't trying to, understand I'm any trying what that to means. Like what not bore and snore everybody no, but, who's watching this. But holy f this is a monumental shift again in how we these, do an analysis. These things that are being cited, these articles, they get pumped out in, in um, law journals and stuff like that on a regular basis. And they're all being, and they get published in uh, Women's Legal Journal and so on. It's like It doesn't matter, women's, men's, And they cite whatever. each other and all this other stuff. But I don't know, want to pit one against this, the other. It's just wrong. But this particular thing is like, you know, this, this then goes into conservative <sighs> versus, you know, more progressive people. And <laughs> what does that mean? What does that mean? So this the four different. judges of the Supreme Court who didn't agree with this analysis are not f***ing not progressive. Right. They're great thinkers. I know. You're like, like, this is just bullshit. But the other thing that was on Wikipedia that's specific to Canada was something called the living tree doctrine. Well, and this is actually a big dispute. Well, you know? the living tree means that law can, can change. We need to adapt to changing concepts. We need to adapt as society develops. Yeah, absolutely. But, who, but we who, don't though? abandon our f***ing rule of law and our concepts and our decisions on a whim. Who, this is a whim. But back to where we started though, who can can change law? Legislators, not the judges. The judges can't change the way they apply and interpret law just no, because no. they feel like it. No, no, but, no, but courts can interpret and sometimes revisit a decision Something that was decided 30 years ago is not necessary. Look, we're going to talk soon about discriminatory policies in policing. And where we've seen in advance, and I'm been, we, I want to get this right. So we have looked at very carefully about discriminatory policies in policing. And we know there's a massively over-representation of minorities and those in, who are particularly vulnerable in our society, in jail, subject to criminal law, and, and subject to police search, arrest. And we're going to cover that in some more detail later on in a much more comprehensive manner. It's kind of connected to this because they actually comment on, um, the majority says, we need to protect women and minorities and marginalized groups. And in the, the separate reasons of the, the minority, they say, you know, this reinterpretation and, and the way these laws are applied actually disproportionately affects those minority. They're, they're going to actually capture the group that, that they're, they claim they're trying to protect. Say that again. They are going to actually end up punishing people within those marginalized communities they claim they're trying to protect. So this is a really important point. Okay. So the one positive thing we've seen in the last five, six years is police services, at least in Canada, and I think maybe so a little bit in the United States, have recognized and have done some legitimate reviews to uncover discriminatory policies that leads to inappropriate, charter-violated searches, stops, etc. And we need to recognize that there is a better way to deal with people who come within the criminal justice system and we need to look at a more holistic approach as to why people are there, what other remedies are available, and how we address this. Okay? But f*** me. This type of s*** is going to affect those who are marginalized. The JJ decision about bringing an application to have relevant evidence admitted because it's presumptively inadmissible these are all access to justice barriers, mm -hmm. right? Just think for a moment. You know, the massive expense, the moment you're charged, the money, the, the loss of employment and all these other things. And it's like, so, and this is another thing we talked about earlier, just as we've seen with people being miseducated about 
um, what's too drunk to consent results in people being charged only for the complainant to be disappointed in court to find out, yeah, actually you weren't too drunk. And, and the whole thing happens because they're being miseducated. So now, you know, if a condom breaks, what, somebody's going to end up getting charged because somebody, you know, no, is it's part of the sexual activity. And then you have to define or defend to say that it was, it was expired. I didn't know it. It was a shitty made condom. Like, that's wrong. And I just want to say something. Are, are we getting close? Are we okay with time right now? I'll tell you when we're 30 minutes. We love our producers. Okay, so, but here's something interesting. By the way, 29 minutes and 53 seconds. Okay, perfect. So there's an interesting section of the decision of the opposing judges. Judicial or academic The, the whole thing is interesting, actually. <laughs> no, I know, but this f***ing really got me. And you pointed it out, so. Little star. Kudos. On the, on the page flag. <laughs> Judicial or academic criticism. As we've already in indicated, the fact that a decision is subject to judicial or academic criticism is not on its own reason to overturn it. Such criticism can be relevant, but only to the extent that it demonstrates that the decision was rendered is unworkable or foundationally eroded. To allow criticism as an unbounded concept to justify revisiting precedent would s subjugate principle to popular views. Right. It's only a seven-year-old decision, Hutchinson. I got to say this again. It's not like a lot of time passed. To justify revisiting precedent would subjugate principle to popular views. Which undermines the rule of law and, and allows well, for... Well, what's popular views? But it, it allows for mob rule, right? Vigilantism is very decisive. It's the same is thing as vigilantism. Well, let's be measured here. No, but that's, that's why we have a justice system because we know what happens when you let the public decide what to do with somebody that they think is guilty of something. Stare decisis is fundamental to the legitimacy of the judiciary. Our court cannot overturn precedent simply because a chorus of voices, even well informed voices, expresses disagreement with our decision. I yeah. think we should end there. <clears throat> I know, because... Honestly, I have nothing better to say than what was stated <coughs> by these judges. Yeah, I know. And, and it's so important because judges sometimes have to make difficult decisions where they All may... All the time. They may personally feel like somebody is guilty of something, but in order to uphold and and and... The reason I love law is because it's got to be consistent. And it's the that. logic base it's of not, it... It's not just that. We have to ensure that any decision is based on principle, evidence beyond a reasonable doubt. And if evidence doesn't reach that threshold, it's better that 12 guilty, or whatever it is, 11 people who are guilty go free and one... You know, we don't ten, want... I think it's 10 and 1. Whatever, whatever the Blackstone is. principle. We want to avoid wrongful yeah. convictions, but this is a brilliant point, <coughs> and it's yeah. no more apposite now you love than that ever. Word. You love that word, apposite. Love apposite. <laughs> Our court cannot overturn precedent simply because a chorus of voices, even well-informed voices, and we're not like law professors, right? And we're not like, with all due respect, we may disagree with you, and we may want to fight you on this in a principled manner. When you express disagreement with the decisions of the Supreme Court, that's not just enough to depart from precedent. And that's really important. We need to protect due process. We need to... We need to the very fact that this case isn't about the outcome, because they all agree on the outcome. The outcome is, is about accurate. The process, the accurate. It shows you how important it is to value the process of... The process of Mic getting... drop! The process of getting to that decision and why it's so important because this is an important decision why the method of getting to that decision is so important is because it's going to apply to other reasoning down the road right so it's not just how they've altered the definition i hope people aren't sleeping. i like that nod i feel so validated when you agree with me no i always agree with you <laughs> most of the time but I, I i don't want to bore anybody but it's not just the fact we agree with the decision there's no debate about that. 
We don't agree with the majority decision on how they got there. And it's fucking dangerous. And this is one of the things where it's like... Because you don't change people... precedent because of popular opinion. And the public needs lawyers. It's popular opinion. The public... I, this, this is such an important podcast because the public needs lawyers to explain the difference between debating over stupid things versus, you know, understanding why it's important and what... It's a slippery slope. But, the, but Which with is all not the a respect, fallacy in this case. They don't just need lawyers. They need people like you, Diana. And You're, thank God, not a lawyer. I know. Because right? Because our heads are ground into... to sound like one, though. Like a pencil, <laughs> you can think this. more broadly. Yeah. You know, and, and, and it's so important here that we arrive at the right decision for the right reason, not because of popular opinion. Exactly. And there's... And there, Twitter, Twitter does not help. <laughs> uh, so I found out. All right. Thank you.